So in, in this lecture, we'll continue our discussion of the Redfield equations and the relaxation superoperator. You'll recall from the previous lecture that we derived by following in parallel the random field derivation, we derived an operator equ equation called the block wings and this red field equation or the BWR equations or sometimes the master equation. And this is a differential equation for the density operator that, that depends on evolution under the commutation superoperator for H naught and evolution or relaxation under the relaxation superoperator gamma in this case. And gamma then was a function of the summation over the double commutators of the basis functions that comprise the Hamiltonian and then the power spectral density function, the real part of the Fourier transform of the stochastic autocorrelation function. We also last time transformed the operator equation into a coupled set of differential equations by expanding the density operator in terms of a set of basis operators, B sub n. The expansion coefficients, as I wrote them in the previous lecture, were small b sub n of t, but you'll frequently see the expansion coefficients written with this angle bracket notation, angle bracket capital B sub n of t, where that notation just reminds us that the expansion coefficients are the trace over the operator or the adjoint of the operator times the density operator. That's how we define these coefficients. So the second notation helps remind us of that. And then we worked through what this meant and ended up with a set of coupled differential equations in which evolution under H naught now is expressed as an evolution frequency omega sub mn and the relaxation superoperator is expressed as a relaxation matrix where cross relaxation rate constants r sub mn then are expressed as shown in terms of, again, the spectral densities and the double commutators. If the operator basis has capital N terms, then we have capital N differential equations that are coupled together, and we can express these then in the form of a matrix. Now we've taken all the expansion coefficients and lined them up as a column vector. These are now numbers, each of these angle bracket B sub n's are numbers. We've lined them up to make a column matrix. And then we have a square matrix that contains all the evolution frequencies omega as shown, and then another square matrix that contains all of the relaxation rate constants. Now, if we were careful to keep the operator base normalized to the same norm, then the relaxation matrix will always be symmetric. So if you do a calculation and end up with the cross relaxation rate constants across the diagonal being different from each other, that means you had an unnormalized basis and you should go back and renormalize. And then these matrix equations can be written in a very compact form in which now we mean by the bold faced symbols the appropriate matrix. So bold faced B of T is the column matrix of the expansion coefficients, i.e. the amplitudes of the different operators. And then bold-faced omega contains all of the evolution frequencies, and bold-faced r contains all the re relaxation rate constants. And of course, inside the matrix r, the diagonal elements will be the auto-relaxation rate constants, and the off-diagonal elements will be cross-relaxation rate constants between pairs of operators or the coherences that those operators represent. Now just as a word of caution, the matrix omega contains not only the resonance frequencies, 
but all the precession frequencies. So that matrix will also contain evolution under any scalar couplings in solution. So these are kind of generalized frequencies, J couplings as well as actual chemical shifts. In doing this, we've then transformed the operator equation for the density operator into what's really a matrix representation of the Louisville superoperator. And this is particularly convenient for doing calculations because this is basically an algebraic equation. Now in some applications, and I won't emphasize this through the rest of the course, the presence of the equilibrium value of the density operator, here shown as B sub zero, can be inconvenient. It's possible to expand the operator basis to include what's called the thermal equilibrium density operator. And then that term goes away. It's incorporated into the relaxation matrix. That's work that's been done by Malcolm Levitt and Ronnie Ghosh in the literature, if you're interested. So this will be our core equation, basically, then for analyzing relaxation in NMR spectroscopy. Now, let's return to the power spectral density function. It's, again, the Fourier transform of the stochastic autocorrelation function. The fluctuating quantities f can be written as the product of some variables that are not dependent on orientation, and then variables that depend on orientation. The variables that depend on orientation, we represent with the spherical harmonics, and then I'll lump all the other variables into some constant of time here called C of t. Why the spherical harmonics? We have to represent rotations of the molecule in NMR spectroscopy, and rotations are handled in a very elegant way using the spherical harmonics. In particular, spherical harmonics rotate under what are called the Wigner D matrices. And the equation here shows then that if we have uh, some vector represented with polar angles omega sub 1, so here the omegas represent polar angles, not frequencies, and we either rotate the coordinate system or rotate the object, we can represent the new spherical harmonics simply as a summation over the index Q in which the coefficients are these mathematical objects called the Wigner D matrices. And importantly, all we have to do is sum over Q. We don't have to sum over K. So if we have spherical harmonics of a particular rank, when the object rotates or the coordinate system rotates, we don't mix together different ranks. And this makes the spherical harmonics a particularly simple set of functions for characterizing orientation. The D matrices themselves are tabulated in various places. Um, they'll reappear later on in this lecture. So if we make the substitution for the Fs, we then have the autocorrelation function of the products of the Cs and the spherical harmonics. And we'll frequently make the assumption that the time variation in the parameters that don't depend on orientation is independent of reorientation of the molecule so that then the ensemble average of the product becomes the product of the two ensemble averages and we have an autocorrelation function for the variables in C and an autocorrelation function for the spherical harmonics. Now this might not always be true and all solution NMR spectroscopists know a counterexample because for the dipole-dipole interaction, C will contain the distance between the pairs of spins that are interacting with the dipole-dipole interaction. And the spherical harmonics 
will contain the orientation of the vector connecting those two spins. And it's easy to see that in a molecule, due to internal motions of the molecule, the orientation of that vector could change and the distance between the two nuclei could change. For example, as some loop goes from folded to more unfolded, the distance could change and the orientation can change in a correlated manner. Fortunately, for structure determination by NMR, those two effects, while they're correlated, tend to somewhat offset each other. So usually the problem isn't as bad as it might seem. And NMR spectroscopists, when doing structure determination, frequently ignore this complication. And for the rest of the lectures, we'll ignore it. We'll pretend we can fact do this factorization. But you should remember this isn't always true. And the case is once you have to take into account correlated changes, for example, in orientation and distance, there's hardly any analytical treatment. It all becomes almost all computer simulation. And then because we like hiding complicated mathematics inside of symbols, we'll invent a new symbol. So now capital J of omega is the Fourier transform, the real part of the Fourier transform, just of the autocorrelation function for the spherical harmonics. So the spectral density only due to orientation I'll call capital J, small j, will refer to the spectral density that includes both the C's and the orientation terms. And then we can think about a few simple limits that in fact are useful. One would be, of course, suppose the C's were constant. Then we simply have the square of the C's multiplying the orientational spectral density function. This, for example, could apply to the chemical shift anisotropy Hamiltonian if we imagine that the chemical shift anisotropy is a constant independent of orientation of the molecule. Another limit could be that the variables in C fluctuate in time, but that fluctuation is slow compared to the fluctuation in orientations. In that case, the autocorrelation function of the C's barely decays by the time the autocorrelation function for the spherical harmonics decayed to zero. So in that case, we can set tau equal to zero for the C variables, and we simply end up then with a prefactor that's the variance of C. And that's shown on the second line. Or the other possibility would be that variation in C is very fast compared to overall rotation of the molecule. In that case, the autocorrelation function in the C's decays to its limiting value before the molecule rotates. And then we have the square of the mean of C entering as a prefactor. These last two cases come up quite often. So for example, when thinking about nitrogen 15 relaxation and the interaction with the attached amide proton in a protein, the bond length is varying because of bond vibrations and also um, off-axis movements of the hydrogen. Those motions are happening on a femtosecond time scale far, far faster than rotational tumbling or librational motions in the protein. So we can regard those as being the autocorrelation function then for bond vibrations is decaying to some mean bond length. And then we would just have the square of a mean bond length. When you look in papers, of analyses of nitrogen 15 relaxation, the bond lengths that are used are not 
the nitrogen-hydrogen bond length you would get by looking in a quantum mechanical force field. The bond lengths are a little longer than quantum mechanics predicts because those bond lengths have been averaged over the motions of the hydrogen on very fast femtosecond timescales. The other limit where motions are very slow comes up, for example, in analysis of NOEs to aromatic rings in proteins. Aromatic rings, a phenylalanine ring, the tyrosine rings are typically flipping so that the signals are averaged. You only see one set of resonances. But that flipping can be slow compared to overall tumbling so that then one uses in data analysis is the variance rather than the square of the mean in calculating the prefactors. So these kinds of limits have important practical aspects in NMR. OK, so our focus now shifts to the orientational correlation function itself, the autocorrelation function of the spherical harmonics. And of course, molecules have internal degrees of freedom as well as overall tumbling. And one powerful aspect of NMR spectroscopy is the ability to probe internal motions of molecules by analyzing spin relaxation. One frequently makes the approximation that the overall autocorrelation function can be written as a product of the autocorrelation function for rotation and the autocorrelation function for any internal motions. And that's shown here in which C sub O represents overall rotation of the molecule and C sub I represents any intramolecular motions. This approximation can be violated, of course, if you imagine, for example, some molecule that undergoes some large clamshell motion in which the clamshell is opening and closing, it's easy to imagine that overall diffusion is different when the clamshell is open than when the clamshell is closed. And then the internal motion and overall tumbling would be coupled. So there are some discussions of this in the literature. But most analyses that you'll encounter to date use this factorization. We've already seen for a spherical molecule that the overall rotational correlation time is just one-fifth times the exponential of the lag tau divided by the correlation time tau c. A molecule with axial symmetry has a more complicated rotational correlation time because rotation around the two axes is, is different. And the result is shown here. It turns out now the correlation function is the sum of three exponentials. And the exponentials have weighting factors a sub 0, a sub 1, a sub 2 that depend on the orientation of the relevant vector in the molecule for example, the bond vector or the symmetry axis of the CSA tensor relative to the diffusion axes. So what's shown here is an American football, for example, with diffusion values d parallel and d perpendicular, where d parallel refers to the long axis of the molecule and d perpendicular to the short axis. The relaxation for a given bond vector for example, shown in red, will depend on the polar angle relative to the d parallel axis. So a molecule, for example, an NH, whose bond vector points along the long axis, will experience rotational tumbling differently than an NH vector that's oriented along the equator. And the different time constants then are shown on the right-hand column associated with each of the weighting factors. If the molecule doesn't have axial symmetry, if it's shaped like an asteroid, then there are three different diffusion constants. Diffusion constants along 
uh, an x-axis, a y-axis, a z-axis in what's called the principal axis frame. Now there are five exponentials describing overall rotational diffusion and much more complicated expressions. Those expressions are in the literature, so I'm not going to reproduce them here. So here's just an example for axial rotational diffusion in which d parallel, I chose to be half the value of d perpendicular. And here are just some sample plots. So the blue curve shows the decay of the correlation function for a bond vector that's oriented along d parallel. The red is for a bond vector that's oriented in the equatorial plane perpendicular to d parallel. And then the green curve, I just happened to pick one at the magic angle. Since we love the magic angle in NMR spectroscopy, that's the green. So you can see that there's a dependence in the autocorrelation function and therefore in the spectral density function on the orientation that the vector makes in the molecular frame or in the diffusion tensor frame. And we in fact can use that information to determine the diffusion tensors for proteins or other macromolecules. So this is very valuable information. The equations of course now are getting more complicated. There's the sum of three exponentials for axial symmetry and the sum of, as I said, five exponentials for an asymmetric molecule. It turns out though that if the degree of departure from spherical isn't too large, there's a very nice approximation due to Raphael Bruchweiler in which we treat a given location in the molecule as if it has its own locally isotropic tumbling time. And different points in the molecule would have a different value of that local isotropic time. So for example, a, the local isotropic diffusion constant for an axial molecule is shown here. It's the isotropic diffusion constant corrected for the orientation of that bond vector in the molecule. And I've shown some graphs here. So these are the same graphs I showed before for zero and 90 degree orientations. And superposed are the single exponential decays that one calculates with this locally isotropic approximation. And you can see that they superpose extremely well. So for degrees of axial symmetry between a half and two, this local approximation works very well. So we can treat the system as if it had a locally isotropic overall tumbling that makes subsequent work simpler. We just have to recognize that every site in the molecule now, every amide N15, for example, will have its own different apparent local overall tumbling time. And we can then take that collection of local times and again extract the diffusion tensor from that. So that's all I'll say about overall tumbling. And now we have to worry about the internal correlation function. On the time scale that we're interested in, the time scales that are going to contribute to relaxation in NMR, picosecond, nanosecond time scale motions. These motions, as best we know, are all overdamped. They're not periodic. And that means that the autocorrelation function for internal motions can always be expressed as a sum of exponentials. It may be an infinite sum, but it's a sum of exponentials. It doesn't have sines and cosines in it. So the summation is shown here. The n equals zero component that's a constant is usually pulled out. And a zero is given the symbol s squared. And that means that the sum of the other coefficients, a sub one to a sub whatever, have to add up to be one minus s squared so that the internal correlation function is normalized to unity when tau goes to zero. 
This quantity S squared is called the square of the generalized order parameter. So S is the generalized order parameter. The NMR experiments are sensitive to its square. NMR spectroscopists used to be very sloppy about distinguishing between the square of S and S itself. Now we're a little more careful because when analyzing residual dipole couplings, the relevant quantity is S, not S squared. So one wants to be careful now in what one refers to and always say the square of the generalized order parameter. The generalized order parameter itself has a formal mathematical definition in terms of, again, the spherical harmonics. And these are the square modulus of the average of the spherical harmonics. If the motion was unrestricted, if the internal motion was unrestricted, so that the angles could take on all possible values, the average of the spherical harmonics are zero. So if the motion was unrestricted, the order parameter would be identically zero. And if there was no motion at all, if there was a single fixed orientation, then the order parameter would become unity due to the normalization of the spherical harmonics. So if there's no internal motion at all, the square of the generalized order parameter is one. And if internal motion was essentially isotropic, then the order parameter, the square of the order parameter would be zero. So this is a quite convenient parameter. We parameterize how rigid the local site is between a value of zero and one. Now, one thing, again, to be careful about when speaking, particularly to physicists or physical chemists, is the order parameter or the square of the order parameter is a property of the equilibrium distribution of orientations or whatever vector you're talking about. It's not dynamics. It doesn't depend on time. It's completely independent of time. We use relaxation, a time-dependent phenomenon, to measure a time-independent quantity. And solution and MR spectroscopists, again, have been rather loose in calling the order parameter dynamics. Time constants, rate constants, are dynamics. The order parameter is the equilibrium distribution, or characterizes the equilibrium distribution of orientations of some vector in the molecule. And again, here are just a couple of simple calculations for analytical models in a model that dates back many decades called diffusion in the cone, a bond vector can move around within a cone freely, but it can't leave the cone. And we can calculate the order parameter, and that's shown as the solid line as a function of the cone semi-angle. So if the cone is narrow, the order parameter approaches unity, and as the cone angle becomes larger and larger, there's a larger distribution of orientations, and the order parameter approaches zero. Another popular model is called the Gaussian axial fluctuation model. In this case, the vector is diffusing on the surface of the cone. It can't leave the cone, so it's processing, but it's not processing continuously. It's just jumping around on the surface. And the order parameter is calculated as the dashed line here. And again, when the order parameter is 1, the site is, is very rigid. And then in this case, the order parameter can approach a plateau value depending on what the cone angle is, because you can never be isotropic if you're trapped on the surface of a cone. These days, of course, we might well interpret the order parameters using molecular dynamics simulations. The analytic models are, of course, always useful for getting some insight but analytic models can't possibly capture the reality of complicated motions in a protein. So as computers become more and more powerful, more and more often the order parameters are interpreted by reference to a molecular dynamics simulation. At some level, if you were asked 
how do I characterize internal motions in a protein? You might say the simplest possible description would be some measure of the amplitude of the motion and some measure of the time scale of the motion. So now we see that we have a measure of the amplitude of the motion, the generalized order parameter. So the next question is, what is our measure of the time scale of the internal motion? And here we have a problem because there's potentially no single time scale. The sum of exponentials could have many, many terms in it. In fact, if we asked what is the exponential expansion of the diffusion in a cone model, that diffusion in the cone model has a very compact expression for the order parameter, but the time constant is an infinite sum of exponentials. So in general, we don't expect to have a single time constant describing the internal motion. And the question then becomes, what kind of approximations can we make? The most popular approximation is what's called the model-free formalism. And now the time-dependent part of the internal correlation function is represented as a single exponential with an effective correlation time called tau sub e. And it's weighted by 1 minus s squared, the sum of all the amplitudes of the internal motions. And the question is, how do you pick tau sub e? What is a reasonable guess for what you would like tau sub e to be? And there are various rational choices you can make. The choice that is proven most popular is to constrain the area under the autocorrelation functions. So we integrate both sides from 0 to infinity. That's a measure of the area under the curve. And we say we would like to fix tau sub e such that the areas are equal the true area on the left-hand side and our modeled area on the right-hand side. And if we do the integrals, we then discover that tau sub e is simply the mean of all the time constants. And that's quite a nice, useful statement. That what comes out of the simple model is our, our guess of the time scale for the internal motion is the weighted mean. And you probably all agree that that's not an irrational choice. The model-free formalism is sometimes criticized because people say it's just a single exponential approximation. And that's true, but it's not a naive single exponential approximation. There's an approximation with a very rational constraint that that single exponential is constrained to be the mean of all the time constants. So here's just a numerical example. So I just calculated two exponential terms with some made up values and an order parameter. So the internal autocorrelation function now is calculated as the blue curve. It starts at 1 because the autocorrelation function is typically normalized to 1 and decays away to a plateau value that's given by s squared. And that's the yellow line, or orange line, on the graph. That's bi-exponential. And the model-free formalism will approximate that bi-exponential using the mean, the mean time. And that's now shown as the green curve. And the average tau sub e comes out to be 533 picoseconds. And you can see how the method works. At short times, you can see that the green curve isn't decaying fast enough. And at long times, it's decaying too quickly, such that the overestimated area in the beginning is compensated by the underestimated area at the end, so that the mean decay is identical. If we then multiply by an isotropic overall correlation function and do the Fourier transform, then here is the model-free spectral density function. It has three parameters in it, the overall correlation time, the order parameter for the internal motion, and the time scale for the internal motion. 
and we can use the spectral density function then to interpret NMR data and it encapsulates then the simple question of how should I characterize motions. So I characterize the internal motions by the order parameter and I characterize the time scale of the internal motions by an effective correlation time that I understand to be the mean of all the internal correlation times. Quite importantly, J0, the zero value of any Fourier transform, is the area under the curve of the time domain function. So J0 is the area under the autocorrelation function in the time domain and the model free spectral density function preserves that area by definition and that means the model free spectral density function preserves J0 and that's also a very useful property because J0 is very important in macromolecular relaxation because that's what determines adiabatic contributions to R2. So that's also a nice feature of this approach. Now we can always add more terms to the exponential. The internal autocorrelation function is likely to have very many terms, so we can add exponentials. So here now we have a two exponential approximation, and this is usually called the extended model free formalism. So now we have order parameter and effective correlation time on what we think of as a fast time scale. This usually means faster than a nanosecond. And we have then order parameter and effective correlation time for motions on a slow time scale, by which we usually mean something longer than a nanosecond, but shorter than overall tumbling. And again, just to give an example, here is another internal correlation function that I just calculated. Now there are four exponentials. And if I try to fit this particular autocorrelation function with just the simple model free formalism shown in green, you can see the fit really isn't very good. But now in red is the extended model free formalism. And you can see that the bi exponential fits the four exponentials relatively well. Now you could ask, can't I just keep going and keep adding exponentials to the fitting function and just fit them all? And there are two problems with this. One is mathematical. Fitting sums of exponentials is extremely difficult. And the other aspect of the problem is what is the actual information content in the NMR data that we can acquire. So there are many, many studies in the literature of N15 relaxation and there's now substantial evidence that we'll talk about in the last lecture that this extended model free formalism is about the most complicated model that the data can support. So you may be able to fit your particular data or a subset of your data with simpler models, but one probably can't fit a more complicated model without overfitting. So we're limited really, of course, by the quality and type of data that we can acquire as to how complicated a model we can fit. So here then is the spectral density function that comes from Fourier transforming the extended model free autocorrelation function. You might notice, by the way, and we'll return to this issue in a future lecture, that what we're learning about are the amplitudes of motion or the distributions of orientations of some vector in the molecule and the time scale for which those vectors reorient, we're not learning very much about the mechanism of the motion. It may be important biologically whether some motion in a loop reflects opening and closing over an active site versus just a disordered loop wagging around like a piece of spaghetti. 
The NMR experiments aren't very good at distinguishing mechanisms. They're good at telling you the amplitude of the motion, the time scale of the motion. The mechanism usually has to come from something else, some combination of computer simulations, mutagenesis, changing parameters such as temperature or ligation state. And this is evident in the models. Our models don't really say anything about mechanism. They just talk about average decay constants and equilibrium distributions of orientation. So that's important to keep in mind as well. OK, so now we have models for the spectral density function. We have the BWR equations that give us a recipe for calculating relaxation rate constants. And that means if you're interested in some coherence or some pair of coherences, you can plug those coherences in with any relaxation mechanism you think of into the BWR equations and calculate then the relaxation rate constant or the cross relaxation rate constant between any pair of operators for any Hamiltonian as long as you can figure out what the basis functions are. And generations of graduate students and postdocs have done that. And the literature is full of tables then of rate constants expressed in terms of spectral density functions. So fortunately for you, you don't have to do very many of these yourself. You can usually look them up. So we'll just run through a few tables of results so that you'll have a reference set. So here are the second order spherical harmonics. We've seen Y20 already in the course, but here are Y21, Y22, Y2 minus 1, and Y2 minus 2. And you can see they're functions of the polar angle and the azimuthal angle. And these angles, of course, if we're talking about tumbling or internal motions, are going to be time dependent. So here are the spherical harmonics. In solution, the three most common relaxation mechanisms are dipole-dipole interactions, the chemical shift anisotropy, and quadrupolar interactions. We've used the chemical shift anisotropy as a model for calculations so far, but obviously in biological macromolecules, it's frequently the dipole-dipole interaction that's the most dominant. But the, these are the functions C, the functions of the various physical parameters. So for example, the dipole interaction depends on the gyromagnetic ratio of the two nuclei and the distance between the two nuclei, and then some physical constants, h bar and mu naught. One thing to note that can be very confusing is frequently authors will leave out the physical constants like mu naught or h bar when writing expressions down, figuring that you know they're supposed to be there and you can add them back in by dimensional analysis because you know at the end of the day a rate constant has to have units of one over second. So you need to be careful because it's easy to be off by very large numbers if you leave some of these constants out. After all, h bar is of order 10 to the minus 34. So if you forget it in the calculation, you're going to get a very strange number. On the other hand, you've been taught since grade school to do units analysis in science. So this is good practice to get the units right. The chemical shift anisotropy, as we've seen, depends on the geomagnetic ratio and the size of the static magnetic field. And what I've called previously delta sigma is just defined as the difference between the principal values of the chemical shift tensor along the parallel axis and the perpendicular axis. And then there's also the expression for the quadrupole coupling constant. And then we need the basis operators. These are the spherical tensor operators. They're shown here for the dipole interaction. Remember that each operator has associated with it an eigenfrequency. So q equals 0, p equals 0. You can see that the operators just have z terms in them. And z operators have no frequency. Z operators don't process. 
and you can see then that the frequency omega is zero. On the other hand, the second line, we have operators that also are q equal to zero, but they're products of the raising and lowering operators. And this is kind of like coherence order in NMR, where if you are asked what's the coherence order of some operator, you add up the number of raising operators and subtract the number of lowering operators. So we would think of I plus S minus as being coherence order zero, and that's in fact why it's Q equal to zero. The frequency, though, is the difference between omega I and omega S, and that may or may not be zero. If it's two hydrogens in a methyl group, that difference is zero, but if it's the amide nitrogen and amide proton, that difference is 450 megahertz at 500. So we need to distinguish the case where the product of the raising and lowering operators have eigenfrequencies of zero and when their frequencies are non-zero. And that's what this index P does. So I've given an index P equal to one just to keep the flip-flop I minus S plus terms distinct from the ZZ terms. Now it could be in some situation that that is identically equal to zero. For example, in a methyl group, the two protons in a methyl group, the frequency difference is zero, and in that case, I might need to combine those two lines into one basis operator whose frequency is zero. This leads on to group theoretical aspects of relaxation that we won't discuss. But that's why in the previous lecture we introduced the variable P. It's to tell apart these sorts of situations where the eigenfrequencies may or may not be identical even though the order Q is identical for different basis operators. The same thing happens then with the single quantum terms IZS plus and I plus SZ could be the same frequency if we're talking about two hydrogens in the methyl group, or they could be very different frequencies if we're talking, for example, about the alpha hydrogen and the, and the C alpha. So again, we need to keep track separately of terms that depend on omega S from terms that depend on omega I. And again, I've just used the label P equals zero or P equal to one. Those labels aren't important. I could have called them blue and green. They're just tags to remind me to keep these operators separate from each other. And then finally, we have the double quantum terms. Now, it turns out in the spectral density function, J of omega, the absolute sign of the eigenfrequencies isn't important. The functions will be even with respect to the sign of the eigenfrequencies. So that's why I haven't distinguished, for example, that S plus should have an eigenfrequency of plus omega S, and S minus should have an eigenfrequency of minus omega S. I don't need to distinguish that. I do have to distinguish relative signs of frequencies. So in the zero quantum term there, for example, omega i versus omega s, I have to pay attention to whether the i spin has a positive frequency or a negative frequency. This is very important, for example, in nitrogen relaxation because the nitrogen gyromagnetic ratio is negative and the proton gyromagnetic ratio is positive. So the eigenfrequencies have different signs. And that means the zero quantum frequency, say at 500, will be 500 megahertz minus minus 50 megahertz, or 550. And the double quantum frequency will be 500 megahertz minus 50 megahertz, or 450. So for nitrogen proton interaction, the double quantum frequency is smaller than the zero quantum frequency. And of course, the opposite would be true for carbon-proton interactions, because carbon and proton geomagnetic ratios have the same sign. 
and people have made mistakes in the literature by forgetting this fact. This is also a good time for me to remind you that omega always includes 2 pi. So when I say the double quantum frequency is 450 megahertz, mentally I know that when I actually do a calculation it has to be 450 megahertz times 2 pi. Otherwise, my numerical calculations will be well off. Okay, we have similar basis operators then for the chemical shift anisotropy interaction and the quadrupolar interaction. And now we just take all these operators, calculate up all the double commutators, multiply them by whichever operators we're interested in, take the trace, and we have our relaxation rate constants. So here for the dipole interaction is just a table of rate constants. IZ, the auto relaxation of IZ is what we think of as R1. So the first line gives an expression for the dipole-dipole contribution to R1 relaxation in terms of the physical constants shown at the bottom of the table and then all of the spectral densities that contribute to relaxation of IZ. The second line shows the corresponding result for SZ. And then the third line shows the cross-relaxation rate constant between IZ and SZ. This is what you call the nuclear overhauser effect. And these three rate constants, R1 of the I spin, R1 of the S spin, and the cross-relaxation rate constant, we now have in terms of spectral densities. We have these values in terms of, with molecular detail. And you'll recall when we did the Solomon equation analysis, we ended up with expressions for these rate constants in terms of transition rate constants W. So we learned that cross relaxation happened, but we didn't have a molecular picture. Now we have a molecular picture. We also have ZZ relaxation, longitudinal two-spin order, relaxation of zero quantum operators, relaxation of double quantum operators, in-phase single quantum, so on and so forth. Every operator for the pairs of spin one-half operators are in this table for the dipole-dipole interaction. So if you want to do a calculation of a rate constant, you have to make some estimate of what you think j of omega is from what you think overall tumbling will be for your protein, what you think internal motions would be, then you simply have to calculate up all the spectral density values at the necessary frequencies and multiply by the constants and then you're done. We have similar expressions then for the CSA interaction and the dipole and the quadrupole interaction. One thing to note, now take a look at R2 for the chemical shift anisotropy. We have some constants times J of zero. That's the adiabatic part of the relaxation rate constant R2. J zero, if you go back to the expressions for spectral density, J0 is just equal to tau C for a rigid spherical molecule. So that relaxation rate constant here, the part that depends on J0 is just variance times correlation time. It's absolutely identical to what we calculated from the random phase model. The new part is the part of R2 that depends on J omega I, the spectral density at the Larmor frequency of the I spin. That didn't come out of our random phase model because that term comes from transverse fluctuations. I mentioned when we introduced the random phase model that there would be a small contribution from R1 type processes from transverse fluctuations due to a kind of lifetime broadening effect. And here it is. Our full treatment captures that term. I also mentioned in the first lecture that for a two-level system 
that contribution would turn out to be one half of the R1. And you can see that that's true. That term is 3 j omega i divided by 6, which is 1 half j omega i. And if you look on the first line, R1 is proportional simply to j of omega i. So this all matches what our expectation was starting out from the very beginning, that our simple model would capture the adiabatic part of relaxation, and then there would be some additional parts arising from the transverse fluctuations. And what we're going to do now it will be kind of a combination of analysis with the Redfield equations and our adiabatic random phase model. And that's because the random phase model tends to be easier for us to get a qualitative picture of what's going on. But the Redfield equations, of course, are the completely accurate model, at least in the fast limit. And this is somewhat similar to other parts of NMR theory, where, for example, one has product operators and evolution under the density operator. But frequently, when you can, you switch back to the block equations and say, can I make sense of things in the block equations? Because you tend to be more comfortable with them, perhaps, because you learn them first. So we'll do the same thing here. And the problem we're going to start with is relaxation interference, because we've talked so far as if there was one kind of fluctuating interaction. But in molecules, of course, there can be fluctuations in the local magnetic fields from more than one mechanism. And a very important one, of course, are combinations of chemical shift anisotropy and dipole-dipole interaction. And fluctuations in these Hamiltonians might be correlated. If the molecule is rigid, and the fluctuations are caused by tumbling. Tumbling will modulate, for example, some dipole-dipole interaction. And it will also be modulating a chemical shift anisotropy interaction at the same time. So we have to be able to take into account these sorts of correlations between fluctuations. What that means is that what I've called so far the fluctuating Hamiltonian H1 might really be the sum of fluctuating Hamiltonians from different mechanisms. Now, the spins don't care. As I've said repeatedly, spins aren't very smart. They only know that their frequencies are fluctuating. We, however, like to partition things. So from the standpoint of the spins, there's only H1 of t, some fluctuating interaction. But for us, it's frequently convenient to partition H1 into some over the different mechanisms that we think about, the dipole mechanism, the quadrupole, the CSA. So M here represents a sum over the different types of interactions that we think are contributing to relaxation in our particular problem. So I haven't put a limit on M because we don't really know a priori how many interactions we might want to take into account. This is back into our derivation of the Redfield equations, back in the interaction frame. We ended up with this double commutator of the fluctuating Hamiltonians, average over all ensembles. So all I need to do now to generalize the treatment is to plug in the sum of the Hamiltonians rather than just simply H1. And of course, I need different summation indices for each of those Hamiltonians. So when I do that, I simply end up with a double sum over m and n, where now one of the Hamiltonians is summed over the m index, and the other one is summed over the n index. And that's basically the only change in the theory. Nothing else needs to be changed. It's quite common to partition that double sum into the case where m is equal to n and then a sum over the cases where m and n are unequal to each other. So I've done that here on the second line. And then we call, of course, the terms where m is equal to n. 
that's just the relaxation from each individual mechanism. So when m is equal to 1, that might be the dipole-dipole interaction. When m is equal to 2, that might be the CSA relaxation. So the sum when m and n are equal to each other are simply the terms we've already calculated. Those are the terms for each individual mechanism. The second term is more interesting. That represents then cross-correlated relaxation between the mth and nth. And if we carried through the calculation following just the steps that we did, we end up finding that we have new terms. We have what are called cross-correlated relaxation or relaxation interference terms. These are relaxation rate constants between pairs of operators again that now have a contribution from two different relaxation mechanisms, M and N. The only difference now in this equation is that the basis operators are labeled M and N, again, for the different interactions. When you go back, for example, and look at the tables, the basis operators are different for the CSA interaction than the dipole interaction. So we have to keep that distinction in this equation. And then our spectral density function is now a spectral density function rather than an autocorrelation function. Now we're asking about the correlation between fluctuations from one interaction relative to another interaction rather than talking about the same interaction. But apart from these rather trivial changes, the theory is completely the same. So let's do an example with the CSA dipole cross-correlated relaxation. So what's shown in the figure then are unit vectors for these two interactions. So mu dd represents the bond vector, for example, between an N15 and its attached hydrogen. Mu CSA represents a unit vector along the symmetry axis of a CSA tensor. And I'll assume that the CSA tensor is actually symmetric so that the problem is relatively simple. Those two bond vectors might not be parallel to each other. And in fact, in proteins, while we frequently treat them as parallel, in fact, they differ by something of order 15 degrees or so. And we'll call that angle between the two of them beta. And we're just going to look at the adiabatic part, again, of the fluctuating Hamiltonians, because we're going to ask, what's the adiabatic part to R2 that comes now by the correlated fluctuations in these two relaxation mechanisms? So again, if we go back to the table, the longitudinal part of the dipole Hamiltonian is the part that depends on the Z operators. So I've written it here. And for the CSA, the part that is adiabatic depends on the Z operator. So that's written. Where now I've used D to indicate the constants for the dipole interaction and C for the CSA, since I have to keep them separate from each other. So the total fluctuating Hamiltonian is the sum of these two terms, as shown here. And now we could simply take this Hamiltonian, plug it into the Redfield equations, calculate the double commutators, and out will come the result. That's a little bit of work. So in order to try to get some insight, we'll at this point step back to our random phase model. So I have this Hamiltonian, but the dipole-dipole part depends on IZSZ, and the CSA part depends only on SZ. So I have to puzzle out a little bit how to go forward, but then I remember that I alpha plus I beta is equal to the identity operator. The populations of the alpha and beta states are conserved. So anytime I want to, I can insert an identity operator. 
and I can replace the identity operator with the sum of the alpha and beta states. So that's what I've done on the second line. I've written the IZ operator as one half I alpha minus I beta, and I've inserted the identity operator in the form of I alpha plus I beta for the CSA interaction. And now I'm going to collect up the SZI alpha terms and the SZI beta terms separately from each other. So now I have two terms, one that's proportional to I alpha SZ and the other term is proportional to I beta SZ. And I tell myself, aha, the term that's proportional to I alpha SZ gives me the frequency fluctuations that affect the I alpha component of the doublet. Remember the nitrogen or the S spin doublet, one of the multiplet components has the coupling partners in the alpha state and the other doublet component has the coupled partner in the beta state. So I look at this Hamiltonian and say that the first line must be the fluctuations affecting the S spin whose coupling partner is alpha and the second line must be the fluctuations that affect the S spin whose coupling partner is in the beta state. Then again, you might think, how did I figure that out? But of course, I know the answer. So that means for the multiplet component whose partner is the I alpha state, we have one frequency fluctuation. And in the beta state, we have a different frequency fluctuation as shown by the difference in the signs in front of the Ds. Now that we know the frequencies, of course, we know exactly what to do to get our adiabatic approximation. We just have to calculate the variance and multiply by the correlation time. So we'll then have two different variances. We have a variance for the I alpha doublet component and a variance for the I beta doublet component. And again, to get the variance, I take the fluctuation, square it, and then average. So I squared the fluctuations and then remembered that the average of a sum is the sum of the averages. So that's shown there for the two terms. Now, what I need to do is calculate the averages of the squares of the spherical harmonics. And this is simple when I have, for example, the square of the spherical harmonic with respect to the dipole-dipole vector orientation. It's simple when I have the square with respect to the orientation of the CSA vector. But you can see I have this cross term in which one angle is the orientation of the dipole-dipole vector and the other is the orientation of the CSA vector. And this I can't average directly. I have two different coordinate frames. In order to do the average, I have to get both of them into the same coordinate frame. So I could decide that I want to move the CSA to the dipole frame. I could move the dipole to the CSA frame. I could move both of them to some other frame, perhaps the molecular diffusion frame. It doesn't matter what frame I move them to, but I need to use a common frame when doing the averaging. And I'll choose to change from the CSA frame to the dipole frame. And again, I can do this quite simply with these Wigner rotation matrices. So now I've just rewritten the Wigner rotation matrices. And I'm going to express Y20 in the CSA frame in terms of a summation of the Y2s in the dipole-dipole frame. And I need them, as you can see, I need to sum over Q. And now the omega DD refers to both the polar angle and the azimuthal angle. Again, not a frequency. So I can take this and substitute in to my term. I needed the average of 
y20 in the dipole-dipole frame times y20 in the CSA frame. I substitute in now my expansion that puts both terms into the dipole-dipole frame. And again, I've made use of the fact that the average of a sum is the sum of the averages. And I've also assumed that the molecule is rigid so that the Euler angles, alpha, beta, gamma, that turn the two frames into each other, that reorient the frames, I assume that those angles are constant so that I can take them outside the ensemble average. Now that's an approximation because, of course, the molecule isn't rigid and the internal motions could be changing the relative orientation of the dipole vector and the CSA vector. So I'm ignoring that and, in fact, in the, at least in the protein literature, that's such a complicated problem that we sweep it under the rug and more or less ignore it anyhow. So now I just need to average these. And you'll hopefully recall from our discussion of the Redfield equations that the autocorrelation functions of the spherical harmonics vanish unless the indices Q are equal to each other. So here we have the autocorrelation function of Y20 with Y2Q. And I know that that will be 0 unless Q is equal to 0. So in fact, my sum of five terms drops down to just a single term once again. So I just then have this expression. And I can go look up in a table what the Wigner rotation d term is for k equals 2 and the subscript 0, 0. That turns out to be our old friend p2 cosine beta. So now I've expressed that cross average in terms of the average over the same frame, the dipole-dipole frame. OK, so now I have the averaging that I need to do expressed in the same frames. I can go ahead and calculate the averages. So after I do the integrals over the orientations, I then find the following three terms for the multiplet partner that's in the I alpha state. And I get a result for the I beta state. So those are the variances. To get the relaxation rate constants, I take the variance times the correlation time. So here I have multiplied by the correlation time. And I call the first term just the auto relaxation rate constant due to the dipole-dipole interaction. The third term is just the CSA contribution to R2. And then the middle term is the cross-correlated relaxation rate constant, which is frequently called eta in the literature. And if I do the same thing for the I beta partner, I again get three terms. And you can see the difference. In one case, I have eta adding to the relaxation rates. And in the other case, eta is subtracting from the relaxation rates. So depending on the relative signs of everything, we have to know the signs of gamma, the sign of the chemical shift anisotropy, to know exactly which terms here are positive and negative, because eta could be positive or eta could be negative at the end of the day. But it means that one member of the doublet is going to be broadened by addition of eta, and the other member of the doublet is going to be narrowed because eta is subtracting from the overall rate constant. This, of course, is what you think of as the Trozzi effect. One line narrows, the other line broadens. And because the CSA contribution depends on the size of the magnetic field, we hope to find a size magnetic field where we match the two and the line becomes very narrow. And for 
proteins, this turns out to be around 900 megahertz. It depends on what we think beta is, as you'll see in a moment in the simulation. So here's a simulation for beta equal to zero, assuming the two interactions are parallel to each other. And I did the simulation at 950 megahertz. Green, then, is our two-step telegraph signal. And from this telegraph signal, I've calculated the fluctuations. I put in an assumed value for the chemical shift anisotropy and bond lengths associated with an NH group in a protein. So green shows the fluctuations from the dipole-dipole interaction. Orange shows the fluctuations for the CSA interaction. And the difference between the two, then, is the cross-correlated result. There you can see the fluctuations are very small. So the line, that line, that member of the doublet component is narrowed by this effect. If I added the two, right, the fluctuations are going to be roughly twice as large because they're going to add up coherently. That means the variance goes up by a factor of four. And that member of the doublet is going to be very broad. Its relaxation rate is now increased by a factor of four over what would have been predicted in the absence of this effect. So that looks great. Things are a little worse because the two vectors aren't really aligned. So here I've done the calculation assuming a 15 degree angular difference between orientations of the two interactions. And now the cancellation isn't quite as good. It's still good enough to be very useful so that if we look in a correlation spectrum without decoupling, we expect, of course, to see this pattern of four components, and one component is very broad and almost completely missing. That's the component in which this relaxation effect is broadening both the proton dimension and the nitrogen dimension. And then we have the two diagonal members in which we're broadened in one dimension and have the trozy effect in the other dimension. And then the lower right, we've picked out the narrow component, both in the nitrogen dimension and the proton dimension. And of course, that's the trozy line. If we were to decouple, we get essentially the average relaxation rate constant. And the line is broad. And if we don't decouple, we can just pick out that very narrow component. And this, I think, was done at 600. So at 900, the cancellation would be even better. If we work on large enough molecules, we don't have to do anything else because the other three lines would relax away. We'd just be left with the narrow line. But for intermediate size molecules, we usually then use a pulse sequence that filters out the undesirable components, leaving just the trozy line. OK, so let's test our understanding a little bit and consider the fact that what we've talked about so far for this Trozy effect is a set of basis operators in which we had I alpha S plus indicating one of the doublet components and I beta S plus indicating the other doublet component. We, of course, could think about another set of basis operators. For example, you might think about in-phase and antiphase magnetization. So we can transform from one basis to another, and that's shown here, in which I have a transformation matrix that then converts the I alpha S plus, I beta S plus basis into the in-phase and antiphase basis. Now this numerical factor of 1 over root 2 is there to make sure that the norm of the transformation matrix is unity. That's important in keeping the right scale for the relaxation elements. So here is my relaxation equation, my differential equation for the 
original basis in which I've used as a shorthand R2 alpha and R2 beta for the relaxation rate constants for the two multiplet components. And now I want to transform to the other basis. So I start by saving myself some notational difficulty by defining the transformation matrix to be T and then multiply from the left hand side by T. T is independent of time so it doesn't matter whether I write it inside or outside the differential so I've written it on the inside of the differential. On the left hand side of this equation T times that column vector returns the in-phase and antiphase basis. So now I'm back in the in-phase and antiphase basis on the left-hand side. What do I do on the right-hand side? Well, I use my usual trick that I can always insert the identity matrix anywhere I want. And the identity matrix is T minus 1 times T. So I've inserted that in between the R and the column vector on the right hand side. And then you can see that T times the column vector again converts into the new basis. So here I am. Now I can cancel from each side these annoying normalization factors. And I'm left with now a differential equation for the relaxation rate matrix in the new frame. So R prime is my new relaxation matrix in the basis set of the in-phase and antiphase operators. Now I would also have to do this transformation for the frequencies as well. We're not going to do that here. We're just going to be interested in the relaxation rates. So my new relaxation matrix is shown as the transformation matrix times the original relaxation matrix times the inverse. I just have to plug everything in and here's what I find. I just ask Mathematica to do the matrix calculations for me and I end up with this expression. So now you can see that the cross-correlated relaxation terms which we're adding and subtracting to the multiplet relaxation terms in the new basis show up as cross relaxation between in phase and antiphase magnetization. So we can think of this cross correlated relaxation as being a differential line broadening in the multiplets or as cross relaxation between in phase and antiphase. And in fact, if you want to go measure this rate constant eta, you can measure the rate constant eta by asking what's the difference in relaxation between the relaxation rate constants for the two multiplets or you can ask how does cross relaxation lead to buildup of antiphase coherence from in phase coherence or vice versa. So the experiment can be done either way and in the literature it is done both ways. So here we have it, again what I just said that in this new basis, eta appears as a cross relaxation rate constant. Now, we know in reality that antiphase magnetization relaxes as well by dipole dipole interactions with remote protons. The other protons in the molecule are going to be relaxing the IZ component of the antiphase operator. And we can handle that in a purely phenomenological way by adding in just a remote contribution from R1 relaxation with remote hydrogens. Now, what effect does this have on the Trozzi experiment? To find out what effect that this has on the Trozzi experiment, we have to transform back to our original basis. So to do that, I'm going to have to now multiply on the left with T minus 1 and on the right with T in order to undo the first transformation and get back to R. So again I ask Mathematica to do those calculations and here's the result. And what does this result mean? Well this means that the remote proton relaxation has two effects. First of all 
the Trozzi line is broadened. In fact, both multiplet lines are broadened by one half of the proton T1, the remote proton T1. And also, now there's cross relaxation between the Trozzi line and the anti Trozzi line. So both of these effects are bad. Broadening of the Trozzi line defeats the purpose. You'd like the Trozzi line to be as narrow as possible. And cross relaxation causes the broad line to cross relax to the narrow line. And that's also bad for the experiment because then the narrow line is broadened by its communication with the broad line. So what do we do? Well, first of all, of course, we deuterate the molecule in the other sites to reduce the density of protons. So that helps by making the remote contribution smaller. But also, the secular hypothesis comes to the rescue. Remember, the multiplet components are separated by J. They're not secular with respect to each other. They're rotating, they're processing at different frequencies. If they're processing at different frequencies, the secular approximation says they won't cross-relax. So in fact, these off-diagonal terms can be set to zero. So the secular approximation comes to the rescue. On the other hand, we need to be careful. Because if we start to decouple, we're going to make the two multiplet components secular with respect to each other. And then those cross relaxation terms reappear, and the Trozzi effect gets defeated. And this will come up in a future lecture when we talk about Trozzi based relaxation experiments. And anytime we start pulsing, we have to be careful that we don't accidentally make these two lines secular because then the experiment will stop working. Then we can test our knowledge of what we've done so far by looking at another famous Trozzi experiment, the methyl Trozzi experiment. We'll again consider only the adiabatic part of relaxation. And we'll ignore CSA effects. We'll just talk about dipole-dipole interactions within then a carbon-13 protonated methyl group. So there's three spin one-half hydrogens. There's the carbon-13. We'll ignore all the remote protons. We'll pretend we've highly deuterated the molecule. So we have to consider then the carbon-proton dipole interactions and all the proton-proton interactions. We'll assume that the methyl group rotates infinitely fast. And the fact that the methyl groups are rotating quickly is key to the whole experiment. And we'll see why um, in just a moment. Now, in the methyl Trozzi experiment, the operator of interest, the coherence of interest, is a multiple quantum operator. So one of the possible multiple quantum operators shown here it's transverse magnetization of the carbon, the S-spin, and the hydrogens, the I-spin. And obviously, there's three I-spins, so we have to sum over all three I-spins. And in the methyl group, of course, the I-spins are all degenerate. This represents a triplet because there are always two passive spins, so that operator if I add in again the identity operator for the other hydrogen spins and multiply everything out, I discover I have a triplet where the inner line has the other spins as products alpha, beta, and beta alpha. And the sum of the outer two lines have the other spins as alpha, alpha, and beta, beta. So we have a triplet. There's a center line and two outer lines. It turns out the Trozzi line is the center line. So we want to show that the inner resonance line is narrow. Now, for 
reasons that aren't so relevant to this particular discussion, I decided to focus on the zero quantum component of the multiple quantum operator. The multiple quantum operator is a superposition of zero quantum terms and double quantum terms. They behave nearly identically in this experiment, so we're just going to focus on the zero quantum part. So the total signal is the sum of contributions from three terms depending on which hydrogen is in the transverse plane. And for example, if hydrogen one is in the transverse plane, the coherence of interest is a zero quantum coherence represented by the first set of bracketed terms and the center line of the multiplet represented by the second set of terms in parentheses. And if I want to, I can fiddle around and put these all back into a different basis that's shown on the second line. That again also isn't so useful. We get the other two components, B2 and B3, just by permuting the indices. So we want to show that this operator representing that coherence is narrow. So again, we just want the adiabatic part of the dipole Hamiltonian. So for a carbon-hydrogen interaction with the jth hydrogen, this again is that component of the fluctuating Hamiltonian, where the angle theta gives the orientation of that particular CH bond in the laboratory frame. And that, of course, is different from the orientation of the next CH bond in the methyl group. But also, that vector is changing in time because of the fast rotation of the methyl group in addition to any other motions. So we want to express this Hamiltonian in a common reference frame again, just like we did with the dipole-dipole CSA terms. And the common reference frame is going to have its z-axis be the symmetry axis of the methyl group. So again, I do that with the Wigner rotation matrix elements. And I have two angles here that I need to worry about. One is the polar angle, the angle between the CH bond and the symmetry axis. That's fixed by the tetrahedral geometry. And then I have an azimuthal angle that controls rotation of the methyl group around that symmetry axis. So here again is the expansion in terms of the Wigner elements. And now I say I can restrict that sum once again to just the zero term because the other terms, the minus one and minus two terms, all depend on the angle phi. And that angle phi is averaging around two pi very rapidly. And the average of e to the i phi of t over two pi is zero. So the fast rotation of the methyl group kills all of the contributions except the spherical harmonic or order zero. And that again, that's key to the experiment. And it means then that this Hamiltonian reduces to a Hamiltonian that now depends on the polar angle for the symmetry axis, not the bond vector itself scaled down by P2 cosine theta once again, where theta is the angle between the bond vector and the symmetry axis. But this doesn't depend on J anymore, so this is now the same Hamiltonian for all three CH dipole-dipole interactions. All three dipole-dipole interactions are now in a common reference frame. I can do the same sort of analysis for the HH dipole interactions. I end up with a very similar result, except now theta is 90 degrees because the HH interactions are perpendicular to the symmetry axis of the methyl group. And finally, because the hydrogens are degenerate, 
I have to include in the analysis the flip-flop terms, which I didn't have to do in any of our previous analyses. But again, those will be expressed in a common reference frame, again, because of fast rotation. And I just, again, took the flip-flop terms out of the tables that we had earlier. Okay, so we have all these Hamiltonians, and now we want to know what happens with fluctuations in frequency. So first off, our operator B1 commutes with the dipole interaction between the carbon and spin 1 itself. We can do this by calculating the commutators, but that's way too much work. We just have to remember that the zero quantum transition is between states alpha, beta, and beta alpha, the flip-flop term, and the dipole interaction changes the energies of those two states identically. So the dipole interaction moves them both up or moves them both down depending on the angle, but the energy difference doesn't change. So the energy difference is independent of the dipole interaction and that means there's no fluctuation in precession frequency and therefore no relaxation. So that first term vanishes quite simply. Then we have the interaction between the carbon and the other two hydrogens, hydrogens two and three. And again, because I know the answer, I know that I want to sum those two Hamiltonians rather than treating them separately. I can treat them separately, but then I have to puzzle around a little more at the end. So I add those two Hamiltonians together. There they are. I factor out the common SZ operator. And now I'm going to play my same game. I have I2Z. I'm going to introduce the identity operator I3 alpha plus I3 beta. And when I have I3Z, I'm going to introduce the identity operator I2 alpha, I2 beta. So I introduce the alpha and betas as the identity operators again, and then collect up all the terms. So that ends up this being the Hamiltonian. And I take a look at that, and I see that that does not have my operator of interest in it. Remember, my operator of interest had the sum of I2 alpha I3 beta plus I2 beta I3 alpha. And the product of, for example, I alpha times I beta is zero. So this operator is going to commute with my operator B1. In fact, that looks like the operator for the outer lines. So in fact, this Hamiltonian is going to broaden the outer lines, but it has no effect on the inner lines. So there I show that the adiabatic fluctuations of the carbon-hydrogen dipole-dipole interactions don't affect the relaxation of the inner line of component B1 and then by extension B2 and B3. So then I play the same game for the 1H Hamiltonians. I add up the Hamiltonians for the proton-proton interactions between spin 1 and spin 2 and spin 1 and spin 3 introduce the partners and do the same analysis end up with a very similar result. And then finally the dipole-dipole interaction between spins 2 and spin 3 trivially commutes with operator 1. So I'm done. The Q equals 0, P equals 1 components don't affect relaxation of the central line. I'm left only with the flip-flop terms. So again, we have the flip-flop Hamiltonian. I, again, could plug these into the Redfield equations. These don't commute with the inner line operator, so there's going to be auto relaxation and cross relaxation. So I could plug these in and do the associated calculations. We, however, won't do that. We'll instead take an approach more similar to our analysis of the Solomon equations. 
just to see what's going on. We're only interested in the adiabatic part of R2, so we're only concerned with transitions that conserve energy. The transitions that don't conserve energy or require parts of the spectral density that come from J of omega at non-zero frequencies, and we're ignoring those in the present analysis. Those contributions are going to be very small. So here are the eigenstates for the three hydrogens. I'm not showing the carbon part because, I mean, it's, it's there, but we don't need it for what we're going to do. But of course, there should be a fourth spin corresponding to the S. So of course, the three hydrogens can all be alpha, 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 beta, alpha, so on and so forth. The two wavy lines show the coherences associated with the first part of our zero quantum operator, the part that goes as I minus for spin one, and then I alpha for spin two, I beta for spin three, plus I beta for spin two, I alpha for spin three. So that's part of the central transition again. So those are the coherences that connect those eigenstates. Now the flip-flop transitions are shown here. So flip-flop transitions between spins one and two that conserve energy, there's only two of them possible, and they're shown there with the red curved lines. Again, since we're only looking at adiabatic parts of relaxation, I only need terms that conserve energy, and I'm only concerned here with the flip-flop Hamiltonian. So here are the transitions where spin one changes state, and spin two changes state in the other sense. So for example, our bottom right shows spin one going from alpha to beta, and spin two goes from beta to alpha. The upper left, spin one goes from beta to alpha, and spin two goes from alpha to beta, while spin three is unchanged. Those transitions then give the following results. And those coherences represented by those wavy lines are now the corresponding operator, but now on spin two. So the flip-flop terms transferred the coherence from spin one to spin two, but it's still a central line transition. It's still a central transition. And that means I can just write a kind of gain-loss equation like I did for the Solomon equations. My coherence B1 loses amplitude with some rate W12, and the coherence corresponding to spin 2 gains whatever coherence 1 lost. So I've just written the gain and loss equation. And I can do the same thing asking what happens if spin 1 and spin 3 undergo a flip-flop transition. So these are new arrows. And after that transition, the coherence is transferred from spin 1 to spin 3, also in the central multiplet. So I can add that into my equation. So now the coherence B1 is losing coherence to coherences 2 and 3 and coherences 2 and 3 are gaining. And of course I have to go back and do this now starting on spin 2 and have a gain-loss equation for it and then starting on spin 3 and have a gain-loss equation for it. And then I add these all together and again then like the Solomon equations I end up with a set of coupled differential equations in which for example the coherence B1 loses amplitude to states 2 and 3, but it gains from state 2 and from state 3. Now I've indicated the rate constants to be different for the different flip-flop transitions, but we actually expect those to be all the same. It's not really important in this analysis. Now the key part is that we only detect the sum of the three transitions because they're degenerate. The methyl coherences are degenerate, so I have to add up B1, B2, and B3 to get my final signal. And when I add up those equations, I find out that the derivative of the sum is equal to zero. 
And the flip-flop terms then don't contribute to relaxation. The sum signal is independent of the flip-flop terms. And that's because the methyl group is a closed system. If there's a flip-flop on one transition, there has to be a countervailing flip-flop on the other transition. So the spins are constantly flipping each other around, but that coherence isn't going anywhere. The auto relaxation is completely balanced by the cross relaxation. And if we had done things in the Redfield equations, we would see that emerge. We would see a coupled set of differential equations such that all the auto relaxation terms were directly balanced by the cross relaxation terms. So I can do that for the raising part of the operator so that this is true as well for the full zero quantum operator that I started with. And that means that my center line isn't relaxed at all by any of the adiabatic fluctuations. The only relaxation of this methyl resonance is going to come from the non-adiabatic parts we ignored, remote contributions from other hydrogens and deuterons, and we hope to make those small by deuterating, and any CSA effects that we left out. So critically, the rapid rotation of the methyl group reduces the dipole-dipole Hamiltonians to a single coordinate system centered on the symmetry axis. And then the longitudinal Q equals zero, P equals zero terms all commute with our center multiplet operator, so they don't contribute to relaxation at all. And then the degenerate flip-flop terms don't contribute to relaxation because the flip-flop terms are all self-compensated within the isolated methyl group. So those three principles lead to this really remarkable methyl trozy experiment where the center line is narrow while the outer lines are broad and decay away very quickly. And it's this experiment, of course, that allows relaxation studies and other studies on extremely large complexes by NMR reaching up into even a half megadalton.